What's up everybody, GenX Dividend Investor here. In this video I'm going to review a dividend portfolio that was sent to me asking for my feedback, so I'll tell you my thoughts about each of their stocks as well as their portfolio as a whole, and then we'll end things with an overall rating. And if you like when I do videos like this, then please hit that thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Note, I'm not a professional wealth manager, so don't take anything I say as financial advice. Okay, I plan to run a poll on the community tab of my YouTube channel so that you can vote on this portfolio. That way we can see how everyone feels about it, not just me. In the last subscriber portfolio review I did three months ago, I voted that I thought it was okay, and 74% of the people who voted agreed with me. 19% of you voted that you loved it, and 7% said they hated it. And if you'd like me to review your portfolio in a future video like this, then follow me on Instagram at Investor and DM me anything you want to share about your portfolio and yourself, like the reasons for your investments, how old you are, your goals, career, retiring timeline, investing experiences, etc. I have a bunch of people who've already submitted portfolios for me to review, and when I do these videos I don't pick them based on the order in which they were submitted, but instead based on what I think would be interesting and valuable to watch. So today's portfolio came to me from a Patreon champion subscriber of mine that goes by Tango Echo Alpha. Tango is 48 years old and lives in the UK with his wife. He works in UK emergency services and his wife works in education. Emergency services are like firemen, police, ambulance, etc. That line of work. Feel free to jump to the timestamp on screen where I start reviewing Tango's specific tickers, but I recommend you don't jump ahead as I'll share some interesting things about him beforehand. So Tango said that his dad is fairly passionate about investing and that he preaches paying yourself first. Paying yourself first means you set aside money for savings and investing before you pay bills or spend your money on something. That doesn't mean you avoid paying your debts, it just means you prioritize saving and investing as a key pillar of your finances. I've always liked the idea of treating your investing like it's a tax that you have to pay. Put yourself in the mindset that you gotta invest and then cut costs or raise your income to try to do that. Like maybe you create a guideline for yourself that 20% of any income you bring in will be invested, and then push to make that happen. Anyway, before Tango worked in emergency services, he had a job in IT, doing a range of software development and consultancy work for some big companies. One regret Tango has is he wished he'd started investing earlier, because he only started investing 3 years ago when he hit 45 years old. Now I can tell you that almost every single investor I talk to says the same thing, that they wish that they had started investing younger, and they wish they had invested more. And I'm in that same camp because while I started investing at age 21 once I graduated college, I now wish I had funneled more into my investments and spent less on video games and cars and such. I also wish I had only invested into conservative blue chip stocks rather than anything else. That's okay though as some good learning came from making mistakes. Tango changed careers into the emergency services when he was in his mid-30s, and before that he was the main wage earner in his family, though now his wife is. He said he always felt like he needed thousands of pounds to invest, otherwise there's no point to it. And for reference, a pound sterling in British currency is about equal to $1.25, and him feeling like there's no point in investing small amounts of cash is a classic mistake that many people make. To me, investing is about going on a better, long-term financial path, and it's something that probably makes sense to do even if you've been on a bad path your whole life or even if that path is only a bit better. I say probably because you should first pay off high interest debt before you invest, and you might want to have an emergency fund as well. But even small changes over a long period of time can yield amazing results. And sure, if you're obesely overweight or something, then drastically changing your diet might yield the fastest results, but even slight improvements can put you on a better trajectory with things. Maybe you eat two bowls of ice cream every night, well then perhaps one bowl is still putting you on a better path. Bill Gates once said that people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years, which is another way of saying that big accomplishments take time. Have a daily goal of walking 5,000 steps or whatever your doctor recommends. Invest $10 a week if that's all you can afford after cutting unnecessary expenses. The point is always try to be on a good path and small changes and improvements in effort over a long period of time can yield life-changing results even if they aren't too noticeable in the short term. Tango said that there are two things that helped change his mind to realize that even small amounts of investments are smart to do. Number one was discovering his trading platform which is called Trading212, and number two was my dividend channel. Trading212 allows you to buy fractional shares, which makes it easier for people to acquire ownership in quality stocks without needing to save up for full shares. Tango said he wonders what his portfolio would look like today if he would started investing at 35 rather than 45, and while that's a reasonable thing to think, I'd like to focus on how awesome it is that he actually started investing, because most people in the world never start. 
and specifically he began investing in February of 2020, which is literally like one month before the big pandemic crash. So put yourself in Tango's shoes. He's 45 years old, never having invested, and right after he starts, the market has a big crash. The SP500 ends up falling 32% before it turns around. That alone would have caused a lot of people to quit investing, and it did. But for the people who've had the foresight to realize that the US economy would probably recover, well, look at things now. The market has sprang back over 93% from the pandemic low. Now let's see how it's done since Tango got in. Well, it looks like the market is still up over 32% from right after the pandemic crash. So it fell 32% right after he got in, and then it recovered all that and went up another 32% from there. Fortunately, Tango wasn't too worried about that crash, because he was using investment cash that he could afford to lose, and because he had studied the market enough to realize that given enough time, good companies have historically always come back. Tango also mentioned that when he started investing, he made the mistake of relying too much on a stock website that I've personally never used, and he unfortunately ended up getting burned. I've never found a website that has automated stock suggestions that I've agreed with, so I can understand his frustration. One example of a stock that he bought based on that website's recommendation was Persimmon, a company that builds houses and is listed on the London Stock Exchange. As you can see here, it's down 68% from where it was right before the pandemic. Another example stock Tango bought was UK broadcaster ITV. It's down 46% from when he originally got in, and both of those tickers highlight why I think that most people should just go with an overall market fund rather than pick individual stocks. Anyway, the good news is that his bad experience with buying recommended stocks didn't deter him from riding the ship, and now he has a portfolio of almost 37,000 pounds of stocks, which is about 46 grand in US dollars, and it's spread across 17 tickers. Right off the bat, one comment I have is that I think 20 to 30 tickers is a good spot to be in for most portfolios, so 17 is pretty close. Less than 20 and that opens you up to elevated risks of one position impacting you too much if something goes south, and more than 30 is simply too hard to track at an appropriate depth, at least in my opinion. And of course, if you have a ticker that's an ETF, then that could change things as well, depending on how much you own. I'll go over his stocks sorted based on his desired target weighting from most to least. So the first company he owns at 8.9% of his portfolio, though he has a desired target weighting of it at 10%, is Microsoft, a company I'm long in. Microsoft has a very low 0.82% yield, a nice 18 consecutive years of dividend increases, a great 10.1% five-year dividend CAGR, and a nice low payout ratio of 28%. I feel like a 10% weighting for an individual stock is about the most that I'd want to see in someone's portfolio, as I don't want any single company to dominate my performance too much. And again, if the ticker is a broad market ETF, then going over 10% probably makes sense. Note, I expect Microsoft to announce a dividend hike this month in September. And let me take a detour for a sec and talk about Microsoft, as recently a guy left a comment on my dividend discord about it, where he said that it was hard to believe that Microsoft was a penny stock back in the 80s, and that if he'd been alive back then, then he'd have told his parents to buy it. The reason he said that was because if you look at Microsoft's stock price history, then this is what you'll see, which makes it look like Microsoft was trading for 10 cents a share in March of 1986. But what that person didn't realize was that these ticker charts on Google account for stock splits that occurred. And since I know that Microsoft split multiple times, it means that a price at a specific date in the past probably wasn't its actual price on that date in the past. I'll show you what I mean, but first you need to understand that a two-for-one stock split is when a company doubles the number of outstanding shares it has, which also cuts the price of each share in half. Stock splits don't change the market cap of a company, since market cap is share price times the number of shares. So the math remains the same regardless if you double the number of shares or if you do a reverse split and end up with half the shares, but each one costs twice as much. Now doing a two-for-one stock split in the days before brokerages let you directly buy fractional shares did help people who were struggling to have enough cash to buy a whole share. But since many brokerages let you buy partial shares based on a few dollars, then doing stock splits for that reason isn't as compelling. However, one beneficial reason to do stock splits is psychological, in the sense that a stock seems cheaper when it costs less. Like if company ABC had 1,000 shares outstanding, and each share cost 100 bucks, then ABC's market cap would be 1,000 times 100, which equals 100,000. If they did a two-for-one stock split, that means for each share you got two, then they'd end up at 2,000 shares outstanding, but each share would only cost $50, and 2,000 times 50 is still a market cap of 100,000. But seeing the stock at 50 when you previously saw it at 100 might make you feel like it's a deal, even though you'd simply be owning less of the company with each share you bought. Let's look at another example. Pretend company ABC did a reverse 1 for 4 split, then they would end at 250 shares, each costing $400, which would still be a $100,000 market cap. And now that we understand that, 
Let's look up how many stock splits Microsoft had since they IPO'd in 1986. A helpful site I like to use is called SplitHistory.com, where you can put in a ticker and it should tell you when and how much a ticker split. In this case it shows Microsoft's first split was in September of 1987, and they did a two-for-one. Then their next split was in 1990, and they did another two-for-one. Looking over this list, they did nine stock splits, seven of which were two-for-ones and two which were three-for-twos. That means if you had purchased one share of Microsoft stock in 1987, today you would have 1 times 2 times 2 times 3 over 2 times 3 over 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, times two which equals 288 shares. Can you believe it? Each share of Microsoft stock that someone bought and held from 1987 until today would have turned into 288 shares. That also means that instead of it being 10 cents per share like the ticker chart shows on the first day, it would actually have been 288 times that amount, which means the actual closing share price for Microsoft back in 1987 was around 28.80 a share. Thus, the learning in all that is that Microsoft was never a penny stock, even though it looks like it was on that stock chart. And now that we understand that, think about the fact that Microsoft is trading for 334 bucks a share today. That means that if you had bought one single share of Microsoft for 28 bucks in 1987, then today that would have turned into $334 times 288 shares, which equals $96,192. How crazy is that? I think Microsoft is actually my favorite stock in my portfolio, because I believe in its potential more than any other one, even though my largest position is in Apple right now. I mean, it's easy for me to see how Microsoft can keep growing relatively fast, whether that's from more business spending on its Azure cloud infrastructure services, or if it's from revenue growth from its AI investments, more growth in its gaming division or whatever. It's an absolutely incredible company. And speaking of Microsoft, someone on my Discord shared this picture they saw on LinkedIn of someone's Microsoft offer letter from 1983. It says, Dear Michael, this confirms our offer to you of a position with Microsoft working in our product marketing group. We think this task will be challenging. Later this spring, we will work out your project assignment. We trust you will treat the details of this offer with utmost confidentiality. Sidebar, it looks like he didn't. Then it says they are offering a starting salary of 34 grand a year and a bonus of up to 15% of the starting salary. Plus they offered 3,500 stock options at $3 per share, plus some other benefits. Pretty good and better than my first job offer that I got around 10 years later when I started at 30 grand a year with no stock options. Now imagine if that guy had taken that Microsoft job and he still held on to those shares today. Then his 3,500 shares would have split into a little over a million shares and would be worth almost $337 million. And if he actually had worked there a few years, then I'm sure he would have gotten even more stock grants. Crazy. Of course, many people would have sold some shares along the way, but it's still fun to think about. Anyways, I think Microsoft is a great company to own, so I like seeing it in Tango's portfolio. I'll move faster now on his other tickers, I promise. Next up, he has Apple at a desired target weighting of 10%. Apple has a very low 0.54% yield, a decent 10 consecutive years of dividend increases, has an okay 6.7% 5 year dividend CAGR, and has a nice low 16% payout ratio. Overall, Apple is a solid company to own. Next up, you have Johnson & Johnson at a 10% desired weighting, and is another company I own and feel is solid, and is a classic favorite amongst dividend investors. It's got some headwinds right now with the talc lawsuits, which have pushed down its stock price. J&J has a 2.9% yield, an amazing 60 consecutive years of dividend increases, an OK 5.9% dividend CAGR, and has a nice low 44% payout ratio. Next up in Tango's portfolio is Coca-Cola at a 10% desired weighting, and it's another company that I own and feel solid, along with is another classic favorite amongst dividend investors. Keho has a 3.16% dividend yield, an amazing 60 consecutive years of dividend increases, a low 3.4% dividend CAGR, and a 69% payout ratio. I've always loved Diet Coke, even though I know it's not good for you. Moving on, he has another good dividend stock I'm long in, and that's Realty Income. O's price has been pushed down recently due to the interest rate challenges we've been having, as higher rates leads to concerns about their ability to acquire new real estate, along with concerns about their ability to pay down existing real estate, and high rates leads to concerns that existing clients may have higher chances to default. Tango's got O at an 8% target weighting. O's got a nice 5.56% dividend yield, an awesome 25 consecutive years of dividend increases, and a low 3.7% dividend CAGR. Moving on, Tango has another solid stock in Broadcom at an 8% desired weighting. It's got a 2.18% yield, an OK 12 consecutive years of dividend increases, an awesome 23% dividend CAGR, and a nice low payout ratio at 44%. Next up is another stock I'm long in and I feel is solid, which is Pepsi, at a 7% target weighting. 
It's got an okay 2.84% dividend yield, an incredible 50 consecutive years of dividend increases, a decent 6.9% dividend CAGR, and a 65% payout ratio. After that is a stock that many of you probably won't recognize, and that's Diageo, PLC, ticker DEO. At least I think you pronounce it Diageo. A PLC stands for Public Limited Company, which is what public companies are in the UK, and Diageo is a solid alcoholic beverage company, and it owns brands you probably recognize like Johnny Walker, Crown Royal, Guinness, Smirnoff, Bailey's, Captain Morgan, Don Julio, and Tanqueray Gin, amongst others. And FYI, one of my go-tos when I drink, which is rare these days, is Tanqueray and Tonic. And like I said, it's hard for me to find good data on UK companies, so temper your enthusiasm on non-American stock data being as accurate, but I included ranges when I found conflicting data, and bottom line, always double check your info before assuming it's accurate. Tango's got a 7% desired weighting for DEO, and it has a 2.54% dividend yield, seemingly has between 22 to 30 consecutive years of dividend increases, a 2.84% dividend CAGR, and a 66% payout ratio. Overall, it seems like a decent company with some great brands. Next up, he has BAE Systems PLC, a big defense contractor, which, as global tensions rise, probably means it has good growth potential. Tango has a 4% desired weighting for it, and it's got a 2.5% dividend yield, and I believe 19 consecutive years of dividend increases, and a 2.6% dividend CAGR. Next up is another solid company in Visa, which he wants at 4% of his portfolio. Visa has a low 0.73% dividend yield, an OK 14 consecutive years of dividend increases, a great 16.9% dividend CAGR, and a nice low 22% payout ratio. After Visa, he's got another dividend company I'm long in, and that's McDonald's, which he has at a 4% desired weighting. McDonald's has a 2.17% dividend yield, an awesome 46 consecutive years of dividend increases, a decent 8.5% dividend CAGR, and a 54% payout ratio. Moving on, Tango has another UK company in Tesco PLC, which is kind of like Walmart, apparently. He has a 4% desired weighting on it, and it has a 3.8% yield, but it looks like it has a spotty dividend history. Next up is a non-dividend quality company he owns in AMD, which he has at a 3% desired weighting. I actually have a college buddy who recently started at AMD, and he loves it so far. Then Tango has another UK company in Unilever, which he has at a 3% weighting, and which apparently is at a European dividend aristocrat. Holders of Unilever PLC shares traded on the London Stock Exchange receive dividends in British pounds, and holders of Unilever PLC shares traded on Euronext in Amsterdam receive dividends in euros. I found conflicting info on Unilever's dividend, so I'll not go over it here, but you will recognize a lot of their products including Ben & Jerry's and Briar's ice cream, Axe Body Spray, Dove Soap, and Hellman's & Best Foods mayonnaise, amongst others. After Unilever, he owns another quality company in NVIDIA. It's got a tiny dividend of 0.04% yield, a 1.3% dividend CAGR, and a mighty 3% payout ratio. And NVIDIA is driving lots of money into R&D, and it's doing well. Next up is a classic semiconductor play in Intel. Intel is at a low 1.29% yield, and have a negative dividend CAGR due to recently cutting their dividend. Intel was floundering, but has had a great year in terms of stock appreciation. Okay, and the last ticker Tango has in his portfolio is Disney, who stopped paying a dividend and he has them at a 2% desired weighting. Disney has really struggled lately, though the more they fall the better they look to me. But these days I'm sticking with dividend stocks and I bet long term Disney will pull out of this slump. And for reference, here's a screenshot of Tango's portfolio along with the returns he's had. So with that out of the way, let's now look at Tango's overall sector allocation. On the left is his portfolio, and on the right I put the overall US market sector weightings as represented by VTI. Visually, you can tell that Tango's tech concentration is high at 37% of his portfolio versus the market at 30%, but I think he's still at a reasonable amount and it's fine for someone who is bullish on tech long term. Generally speaking, I think modeling your portfolio after the overall market is a good way to go. His consumer staples is pretty high at 31% of his portfolio versus the market at 5%, which seems low to me. That being said, it's pretty common for dividend investors to go higher in consumer staples. His financials, industrials, consumer discretionary, materials, energy, and utilities were all low relative to the market. But overall, I think it's fine. Tango said that as time has gone by and he's continued to learn more about investing, he's gotten to a spot where he's pretty happy with the stocks and he plans to hold on to them for the long term. He also said that last year he inherited some money when a relative passed away and he used some of it to pay off his mortgage, and that being mortgage free is the ultimate sleep well at night feeling for him, so now he's really focused on investing more in his portfolio. He plans to use his portfolio dividend income to enhance the retirement pensions that he and his wife will get. Lately, he's also been thinking about changing careers into something that is less stressful and draining than emergency services is, 
and he sees his dividends as a way to help make that happen. Like in an ideal world, he would like to work part-time in retirement, so a barista fire approach may be when he's in his early 50s. Fire stands for financially independent, retire early, and barista fire is when you retire before the normal age of 60 plus, but you take on a part-time job for extra income and potentially subsidize health insurance. I actually prefer the acronym financially independent recreational employment. Anyways, Tango said that his portfolio is held in a tax-free account called an ISA, which is kind of like a Roth. He also said that he pays a slight tax when he buys shares of UK stocks or has US withholding taxes, but other than that his dividends and capital gains are tax-free. Another issue he deals with are currency exchange rates. Beyond his ISA account, he also has a small taxable account, because you can't deposit more than £20,000 into an ISA account in a single tax year, and sometimes he wants to deposit more than the annual limit. In this case, his taxable account only has one stock in it, and it's J&J. He named his taxable account the J&J Appreciation Society as a nod to PK Investing, who is a guy named Pierre on my Dividend Discord, and who has his own dividend investing channel that I'll include a link to, as he occasionally posts videos on it. A challenge Tango faces is convincing his wife that investing isn't gambling and doesn't have to be risky. Understandably, his wife has read that some companies go bankrupt, and so he's had to convince her that their portfolio is solid and that leaving money in the bank is a surefire way to lose money in the long run. He also said that he doesn't want to invest in real estate as he wants a more hands-off investment approach, which is why he likes dividends. Okay, and what sort of rating would I give his portfolio? Well, overall I like it, so I'm giving it a thumbs up. I'll leave a poll on the community tab of my YouTube channel where you guys can vote thumbs up if you like it, thumbs down if you don't, or thumbs sideways if you think it's just okay. And remember, if you'd like me to review your portfolio in a future video like this, then follow me on Instagram at GenXDividendInvestor and DM me anything you want to share about your portfolio and yourself, like the reasons for your investments, how old you are, your goals, career, retiring timeline, investing experiences, etc. And now I'd normally do a shout out of my latest Patreon aristocrats and kings, but I'm still all sold out. So instead I'd like to thank my all-star Patreons, i.e. those supporters that have been signed up to my Patreon for over a year and continue to stay on board. First I'll thank my longtime kings, which are my highest tier of Patreon supporters. Then I'll thank my longtime aristocrats. And finally I'll thank my Patreon champions. Thanks folks, I really appreciate your long-term support. Finally I'd like to thank Seeking Alpha who sponsors me. I paid for their premium membership for years because I value their articles and associated comments so much, and these days I'd literally never buy or sell a stock without first reviewing what Seeking Alpha has on it. Whatever you do, please hit that thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. And I highly recommend that you join my free dividend discord chat server, which has over 10,000 dividend investors on it from 76 countries around the world. Also please follow at Gen X Dividend on X. Thanks for watching, stay positive, and I'll talk to you again real soon. I am not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.